So Shane, happy, very happy to have you here today for this conversation. Uh, how's it going? How's it at Pasnia? Hey, uh, yeah, things are good. Uh, things are good. Um, as uh, um, for folks who listened uh, who listened to the Volney podcast and caught our last conversation, I'm working uh, working on uh, food self sufficiency here at uh, the Free Republic of Pasnia, as I'm calling it. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's going well. Uh, I guess since the last month month or so, we've we've talked that ducks are about twice as big, if not more. And uh, yeah, I just uh, just got another five lambs uh, this past weekend, and uh, we'll be getting a, a few new goats uh, as well over the next week or two. So um, yeah, the the objective is to uh, is to double double the crew each year of uh, of lambs, and uh, do we uh, d achieve that uh, this Exponential past weekend? Growth. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Does that scale forever? No. It well, no. It only scales to a certain point when you when you have twenty two acres. There's only so many so much doubling. Um, but but yeah, we just uh, just recently in the past couple of months we ran. Uh, I've got there's basically two two fields two um, on either side of the driveway, and we've got electric fences running down the the whole side of the uh, I guess the west side of the driveway and then on the east side of the driveway um yeah that one's not uh that one's not uh, fenced off yet but uh yeah next year or two we'll uh i'm, I'm, I'm visualizing uh, a field full of lambs so um that's that's what we're working on over here uh, as well as uh, obviously more of the uh, the second realm sort of uh intentional community uh, foundational stuff so um yeah things are good uh it's progressing just uh taking our time and enjoying it and uh uh yeah i guess that's uh pretty much it right now Oh, fantastic! I mean, it—it it seems like you're you're pretty far down the Bitcoin or freedom and self liberation rabbit hole. But l let's go back a couple of years. Like, wh what do you think kind of kickstarted your your role uh, down this journey, and what motivates you? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I I actually started uh, Liberty Attack Radio, which is, is now defunct. It's uh, Liberty Liberty Attack Publications. Uh, where we publish uh, actually a second round book on strategy and some some other uh, some other agorist and and crypto anarchy sort of uh, sort of books. But uh, yeah, I started LUA Radio back in February of 2015, and uh, you know, I was very, very much at that time um, was not uh, into the self liberation stuff. wasn't uh, what I would call an anarchist. had never even heard of the term Vanuin. I uh, obviously hadn't come across Second Realm stuff yet. Um, I was, uh, I guess, you could say, more of a minarchist constitutionalist here, um, you know, um, in, the, in the states. And um, I guess more in kind of the conspiratorial conspiratorial realm, uh, dug through a lot of uh, Bill Cooper, uh, the now now late Bill Cooper's uh, material for anyone who might be familiar with that. So that's actually where I started was way back, way back there, back in 2014, 2015. And uh, yeah, very soon after I started Elliot Radio, um, I came across some some anarchists, and I guess uh, anarchy wasn't what I'd been told it was, uh, as is uh, as is the case for most everything. And uh, I. Uh, it went down uh, the deep dive of Austrian economics, you know, read the, the Rothbard, the Mises, got through human action, which I'm still pretty proud of, um, and uh, got through kind of the economic stuff, went through some of the philosophy, and I got to a point, uh, you know, being in alternative media, or, you know, there are a lot of podcasts, a lot of, you know, libertarian podcasts and radio shows and, and uh, all that, but there really was a, a major lacking of, uh, of solutions. Like, okay, um, obviously free markets are good, like that's, that's the preferable, preferable way, right? Like no, no coercion. Um, and yeah, obviously the state is the biggest inflictor of that coercion, so why don't we just kind of, you know, let's, let's, let's be free now, like what, what are we going to do about it? And there wasn't really a whole lot of talk about it beyond agorism. Um, obviously, Bitcoin was, was around at that time, but it still wasn't as big as, as was, it obviously wasn't, uh, you know, as, um, where, where, uh, where it is today. So yeah, I, uh, I, I got, uh, I, I saw an opening and uh, really just took it. And uh, we did uh, what I call the direct action series. We did that over on Elliot Radio back in uh, 2016. And uh, yeah, from then I uh, came across Vanu. Um, which uh, is we can we can definitely get into get into more, but um, I came across Vanu and uh, Rayo and this uh, I guess this really hidden portion of libertarian history, and uh, you know a very very um, practical and um, very uh, forward looking, um, you know very, very Rayo the uh, the main the uh, the founder of Vanu actually now now we know that for sure, um, he was a very forward thinking individual and back in the 1960s was writing about uh, um, as we've talked about in conversations over at the Vanu podcast, Max. Uh, uh, he was very much a cypherpunk. He, uh, you know, obviously utilized a pseudonym. Was talking about, uh, you know, encrypted, I guess, uh, ham radio, encrypted ham radio networks um, that would serve as, you know, commerce back in the day. So, like, he was a very forward-looking individual, and um, that kind of opened my eyes to to a lot of things. Uh, these radical lifestyle changes um, that uh, that that Vanu kind of relies upon, and uh, came across Second Realm. Um, at some point, and uh, I, I love that. Um, I love that because uh, there's there's a lot of uh, organizing the digital realm, you know, like with, with Bitcoin, for example, and that's fantastic. But um, you know, at, at, uh, you know, especially after last year, 
um, when a lot of things started breaking down in the physical world and, um, you know, um, access to food and, you know, other survival, other things necessary for survival became difficult. So, um, you know, the, the most important thing now, at least, in, in, at least what I'm focusing on is, is actual, actually organizing in physical space and time. And that's what, where I saw so much value in, in, in a second round book on strategy is, um, well, you, obviously there are digital pockets of freedom, um, that provide, that provide freedom, but, um, you know, the physical space and time is important too. So, um, that's, uh, I, been, I guess that's that's kind of the, the the long and long and short of it is I, I I randomly I just stumbled across things in my in my path and um, some of them seem to, to to make a lot of sense and seem practical and um, you know here I am uh, at the Free Republic of Pasnia and uh, I guess uh, I guess just kind of make making a go at uh, putting together the Secrom network here in the and, and uh, you know what's uh, here uh, you know in, the, in so-called uh, USSA so um, yeah that's that's pretty much it pretty much it. Nice, nice. Uh, very nice layout of, of all this conversation that we can have now. Many rabbit holes to go down to. Uh, <laughs> first string that I would like to pull uh, is actually Lib or Liberty Under Attack uh, Radio. Like th this kind of seemed to be like your, your forte, your first step into this entire ecosystem. Uh, but I mean, why? Like, why did you decide to kind of speak up and, and to share this knowledge that you were gathering? Yeah, yeah, I guess... Um... Really, it, it, uh, it and, and I, I guess I kind of went over it very quickly. But Bill Cooper was a major, major um, foundational part um, of 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 you know where I uh, you know where of where I am today. Essentially, like I said, I went through a lot of his material. I went through all two thousand plus hours uh, on his on it that are uh, archived. I think they're still archived on on his website, outofthetime dot com. Um, but I went through all those archives, listened to his you know nine hour pre his all his presentations that are on Fascist Tube. Um, you know, I dug through all that material, and uh, you know, it, it all really resonated with me at the time. And uh, you know, I saw it. You know, really valuable. His focus on the Constitution. He was, um, you know, he was actually doing things. You know, organizing militias there in Arizona, and that was really important to me at the time. And um, I guess uh, there was uh, one one part of uh, in one of his presentations. I think he was saying uh, um, he doesn't. He obviously he didn't care if people disagreed with him, and he he obviously is for you know freedom of speech. And he, he, one one thing he said was you know if you if you you know um, um, if you have something to say, start a radio show. And that was like very impactful to me at the time. And I uh, just kind of uh, decided uh, you know Bill Bill uh, you know died in two thousand one. And at that time, I, I didn't see a replacement. Like I didn't, I wasn't familiar with, I guess, the so-called replacement for Bill on the radio, and that's what I wanted to do. Um, but that very, very quickly changed. So that was my original motivation. Was um, my the original path was just that uh, you know I didn't see anyone that was you know filling the the gap of truth that he was, and I thought I was going to be that person, and everything worked out very, very differently. Um, I guess not not necessarily differently, but um, that it, it's. Uh, yeah, it didn't end up uh, where I thought it would for sure. Um, but yeah, that that was pretty much it. And obviously, there was a, a passion for freedom, um, for what I, I guess what I thought freedom was at the time, um, which certainly that's evolved. But um, what, what yeah. was your view of freedom at that time? Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, I was a anarchist constitutionalist, so my my view on freedom was was basically, um, I guess, uh, the very confused view of freedom. Um, I think at that time I was even pro police, which is strange. Um, thinking about, um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was really just kind of the um, the the minarchist, uh, you know, limited government constitutional position. Like that was it was just that generic kind of starting point where a lot of people get stuck at. Um, but yeah, I, w I wasn't there for very long. But it was, um, and then it, it evolved with 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 Bill, and it got back to kind of um, more of the you know, the, I guess the, the actual. I guess so-called original interpretation of the Constitution and, and militias and, um, and and those sorts of things. Uh, kind of the, the I guess the a lot of that constitutional militia type stuff. That was that was where I was at that time. Um, that that was that was where it was. Uh -huh, interesting. And what, what type of format was that radio actually? Was it just you blabbering and doing presentations as, as Bill often did, or was it more a guest type of interview? Um, so the first few months, I guess it was more so, um, we had a couple guests, but it was a two hour live radio show. Um, sometimes I had guests, sometimes it was me and, uh, me and a, a co-host, like many, many co-hosts over the, over the few years on, on LUA. But, um, yeah, a lot of time. uh, initially it was more so just me and me and co-hosts and then be after that, um, especially like the direct action series, it was always interviews. So, um, pretty much it evolved into, into an interview only format, um, pretty quickly, I would say. Okay, so uh, why did you hone down on, on kind of this conversational, either with a co-host or even with a guest? Mm -hmm. Like, w why this type of format? Uh, what did you get out of it? And what do you think your listeners got out mm -hmm. of it? 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, especially for the direct action series, um, you know, these were especially back in 2016. Still now, there's a lot of a lot of these strategies and um, you know lifestyle changes that I haven't tried out myself. So the the value of having a guest is that these people were all had all been doing these things for you know few years or five years or 15 years or 20 years. They had a lot of experience. They had a lot of resources. A lot of knowledge. Um, so that was it. It, it kind of naturally evolved into that because it would have been. Um, there's only so much that I was familiar with when I was uh, when I started. I guess when we did the direct action series, I was like 20, 22 or 23 at the time. I really didn't have a lot of life experience to, to draw upon there. So it was, um, yeah, it was it was pretty much primarily the the interviews where a lot of that a lot of that value came from. Um, really, really incredible guests. Um, that you know we're doing a lot of incredible things back then, and uh, a lot of them still are. Um, so yeah, that'd be the the major the the major benefit. I mean, that's that's where I I, I got a lot of knowledge out of it. Got a lot of, uh, um, I mean, it expanded my worldview a lot. Um, yeah, a lot of these a lot of these things. Uh, a lot of, they don't talk about these strategies. Um, you know, in your um, in your thousands of hours of you know indoctrination in government you know government schools, they don't talk about these things. So um, I, and that's kind of been. Um, something I've I've really honed in on in the past in the past year or so is, um, you know, gotta, gotta expand that uh, that view. Of, it, it's, you gotta keep. It, it's it's hard to find where I guess where the, um, it's hard to figure out where the pro, where the I guess where the propaganda and brainwashing ended. So, um, anyway, anyway, um, that's 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 base that's that's basically it. Um, yeah, base yeah, just a lot a lot of value from guests, a lot of value from guests for sure. So and, and yeah, for, for sure. Like I, th I think it's also a great excuse of, of being a podcaster, radio show host, uh, to kind of get yes, interesting yeah. people to talk to, <laughs> because kind of everyone likes to to be publicized and to be uh, well talked about. Uh, and for you as the host, it's a great way to actually talk to people and to ask questions without kind of having this weird feeling of uh, interrogating someone mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's publicly announced. Right. Yes. And, and, and beyond that, too, I mean, you, you, uh, that, that's a, an important thing too. the networking, um, you know, just have, being able to have these conversations, you know, reaching out to, um, you know, pretty, pretty large people, I guess, pretty popular people. I wouldn't be there'd be there'd be no reason for us to have a conversation before. Right. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Um, it, it, it definitely provides a, a very good excuse um, for, you know, starting conversations with people. And it's a it's a, it's a good opportunity. It's open up the conversation for, for you know, for for the for the public so um that that's another thing but but you know talk uh, going back to the free public of Pasnia too um i mean the the radio show is what well, it was the foundation for everything i'm doing now too um so i, I found out about through LUA radio um something called the midwest peace liberty fest in michigan um in 2015 through a colleague and calling i met a colleague i met on, on the internet who's started a little i guess organization liberate rva down in richmond virginia cal Molina. he told me about this freedom festival that uh you know is taking place and i uh you know just ended up ended up showing up there and now um i've got uh um obviously you know um we uh here at Pasnia we incorporate you know private security culture principles. Um, only people who I know or who have been vetted can come out here. Um, well, my first layer of trust, essentially the the first people that came out here for Vani Fest one, um, were essentially like you know the twenty or twenty five people I've been going to Freedom Festivals with, um, especially the the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest for the past five years or so. So, um, as far as the I guess that, that that's a pretty pretty significant thing too is yeah the, the podcasting. Um, not only did it just provide you know good you know online networking skills like um, an editor for Agoras Nexus now. Um, so I, I you know get paid Bitcoin to um, you know edit articles over there. Um, so that's that's pretty neat. That wouldn't happen without the podcast and all that. So, I mean, yeah, um, obviously the online stuff is great, but it's manifesting into physical space and time. Like we're actually building something here. Um, we're that we're we're building something here, and it's uh, it's pretty incredible. And it all started with um, just from just I guess. Uh, very, very, you know, not lack of a plan, lack of a vision. I was just doing what I thought, uh, doing what I, what I was passionate about, freedom, and was just going to see where it led. And yeah, that's, I guess, here we are. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, and right, this, this freedom and this kind of spontaneity can be very, uh, well, disruptive at points, right? And, and you can almost radically change your, your course of action. And, and you said that this happened to you, right? That you some, eventually moved on from this radio type. Kind of what led you to that change? Yeah, yeah. So I guess um, really, um, I I wrote my book. I guess I, I, was, I finished my book. Um, well, I guess mid to, mid 2018 or so. Um, Vanu the search for, uh, Vanu uh, strategy for self liberation, and um, I suppose that that was about the time I was wrapping up LUA Radio. I mean, I'd I'd, I'd already been doing the Vanu podcast, and most everything we talked about on LUA um, could have been worked into Vanu. So I did, I didn't see a point in containing both of them, and LUA Publications kind of naturally. Um, kind of uh, naturally started out of that and 
um, I guess it was it was right around that time. Like there was it was just I don't know changes in the air or something. I, I had just started a, a new job as a, an electrician apprenticeship or electrician apprentice, and I was uh, you know gonna do that. You know, it's good paying, best paying job I ever had was you know was you know trade, and uh, you know it wasn't uh, it wasn't a bad job. I I enjoyed it. You know, there's you know lots of learning, lots of opportunity, but after about six months or so, like. I just stopped going in. Like I, I just, I, I wasn't feeling it anymore. I, 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 I guess I, I made a decision to move in, move to uh, Austin, Texas, uh, move in with my co-host of the Vonnie podcast at that time, Kyle Reardon, and uh, just made us made a quick random, I guess, move to Austin, Texas. Never been to Austin before. Just kind of randomly felt like I was called to do it. I guess that's that's the best way that I could, that I can explain it. You know, looking back on it, um, but I ended up in Austin. Was there for for a couple few months. And um, they they were renting an apartment, um, and the lease was coming up um, near the end. The lease was coming up, and I had a pretty quick, I had another pretty quick change in living situation that I had to make. And it just so happened that uh, my buddy Jason Henza was coming down um, from Chicago to, uh, um, on, you know, driving down to Acapulco, Mexico. And uh, I, uh, he, you know, he said, you know, I can come come right by there, pick you up. We we'll go to Acapulco, and um, you can come stay out there as long as you want to with me. And I was like, oh. so I, I. I, uh, you know, made another crazy move. Um, never been to Acapulco um, before either, obviously. Never driven through there. Been to Mexico a couple times, like, tourist spots for, for you know, vacations. But never dr- never road trip through Mexico. So, um, yeah, I uh, hopped in the car with him, and we road tripped Acapulco. I stayed there from, um, uh, I guess, November to December um, 2018, was it? 2018, yeah. That's, years all run together now, really. But, yeah, it was at the end of 2018, stayed there uh, until uh, until Christmas, and then came back to... I was going to come back for the holidays to see my family and, um, never, never got back to, to Mexico. But, um, yeah, I, I ended up, uh, ended up back, uh, coming back to the homestead where I am now had no plans to, to start what I, I'm, I'm start, start what I have going on here now. But, um, it was just like, with, I guess within the span of maybe like six months, um, it was, uh, uh it was a pretty nomadic adventure. Um, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of spontaneity. Um, no real plan or, or, or vision was just kind of going, like going with it and seeing, seeing where, where things ended up. And, um, like I said, I ended up back here at the homestead and, um, couple, by that time, a couple, uh, some, some, some folks in my network had started this, uh, I guess this, uh, travel, um, you know, uh, this, uh, travel job. And, uh, you know, they, they'd, uh, they'd, they'd stop by the property every once in a while and it kind of naturally coalesced into, um, a spot for some, for some of my nomadic people to, to stop by and camp and, and all that. And, uh, yeah, last year uh, that that's I guess the um, the the worldwide nonsense kicked off, and oh no, I got a little panicked. I I eat only meat essentially, and um, when uh, there were fears of uh, meat running out at the grocery store, which I was dependent upon then, which is not a good thing, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing now. But um, <coughs> yeah, that that fear kind of hit me, and uh, I went and got some lambs and some goats, and uh, here we are today. So um, yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it certainly wasn't a smooth. Um, a smooth, well planned, well executed, um, <laughs> you know, plan by by any means. But um, you know, I think this is kind of the way that it, that it, that it had to happen. Um, I mean, it's kind of it's, well, it's the way that it did happen. But um, I don't know. Um, it wasn't wasn't easy, and uh, you know, still figuring things out. I, I've obviously like before, and I've in in this life, like I've I've never done anything with like farming or livestock or anything like that. So I've I'm just learning everything as I'm going, and uh, you know, it's hopefully it pans out. It's going well so far. So that's kind of what I'm what I'm banking on to continue. Yeah, it's qu- it's quite incredible how adaptive humans can be, right? And and how we can fit even in, in stressful, ever changing situations, and somehow make the best of it, right? So, w- what do you think were some of the upsides as well as the downsides of that kind of erratic, nomadic uh, lifestyle? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess um, the with, with at least with, the, with at least the what I did the the most I guess the the worst thing was that I was I was basically wholly dependent. Um, I mean, I, I could travel, um, but I, I didn't have, uh, you know, a good network of like online jobs to keep me to keep me afloat at that time. So like it was very, very, um, you know, very sketchy, get sketchy financially. Um, so that was that was kind of, uh, I guess, one one kind of downside um, that kind of uh, the, the unknown, which the unknown is also a positive too, in my opinion. So it, it kind of goes either way. Um, but really the positive and, and this was um, I guess this was the part to my my entire decompression process from the, de- the from the survival society, um, like really like a the, like a and, and I noticed this myself. But with people it, when you're in a you know nine to five job, um, you know, 40 hours a week forever. 
um, and you're always within that survival society mindset, you know, go, 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 survive, survive, survive. Um, you know, like it's, it's very, like it, it's, uh, you don't really have a lot to, a whole lot of time to think about anything else. Right. So, um, that really, that was kind of the first opportunity I had. Um, cause we, when I was, I was either working and or going to higher level indoctrination college, um, you know, before that. So there wasn't a whole lot of time to really think about anything to, to reflect on my life growing up and, and all of that. So, um, that was really the first time where I, I call what I, I call, and, and this is what Rayo called it too, back in the 1960s. But, um, I live what I call now a liberated lifestyle where my time is my own. I, I decide my schedule. I decide what I do. Um, and that started, um, essentially like it, it really fully started, um, I would say last year. But that, that was kind of the first opportunity I had for, for a, a multiple month span um, to really start going through that. So um, that's, um, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the biggest thing. I don't even remember what the question was that got me, got me going on this. But that was, um, I guess, oh, you're talking you're up, ups, and, ups and upsides and downsides. That's right. Um, so, yeah, that was a major upside, a major upside that even though um, it was uh, tumultuous, even though it was, um, you know, very dicey at times, um, like there was, my time was my own still. And, and there was a lot of value in that. There was a lot of, you know, even through kind of the chaos, there was that, um, kind of that, that kind of calm, you know, that, that the, the freedom was, I, I could kind of feel that, that little, I guess that, that hint of freedom. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, certainly the, the catalyst for a lot of things to come. And, um, yeah, I'm th trying to think of any other up upsides or downsides that come to mind, but not not really. I mean, that was the biggest upside, and the other the the other one, which is just kind of obvious when you when you, um, um if if you're in a, if you're in a position like I was, that's just kind of you're, you're going to deal with, um, you know, money might be tight, but at the same time, like there's 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 other benefits too. So yeah. Yeah, like to the financial aspect, right? For for one, if you're constantly on the move, like a, a meat space occupation is probably going to be tricky. I mean, there are not that many physical occupations where you can be that flexible with where you are in meat space. Well, of course, when working in cyberspace on you know whichever project, uh, that allows you a lot more meat space flexibility. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I would guess that nomads who really do have this uh, digital income, hopefully in Bitcoin, right, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of solves or at least you know helps with that first problem. Oh yeah, it's it's huge. Um, it's 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 definitely huge, and it's why like uh, over at the Vani podcast, the first thing we talked about in season two, like when we got to you know the action, was financial independence. Because um, it's it's that 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 time really that time is that time is important. Um, it's really important. And then just um, there's also the fact when we're talking about Vanu and and vulnerability to coercion. Um, you know the the servile society nine to five employment employment makes one very vulnerable to coercion. And a lot of time there's you rely upon one source of income, and that's not a good thing. That's not a wise thing to do, as we kind of figured out um, over the past year. For those of us who didn't already know that you know relying upon one single source of income was unwise. Well, now 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 people know. Um, so yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. The 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 internet, a lot of these opportunities, um, um, you know, these online opportunities, Bitcoin, um, it's huge. Um, definitely, definitely huge. Um, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, so much so there was a project. There's there's an out of funk project that I, that I was working on called Darklands, which was it was supposed to be, um, it was supposed to be. Um, yeah, basically that a job board a privacy focused job board um like you have your indeed um well one that would you know use pseudonyms and you know um have bitcoin privacy by default and those sorts of things it's not it's 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 a defunct project now we don't, don't have time for it but um yeah it's it's definitely definitely important thing and it's it's really the it's really um it's really the first step um it's really really kind of kind of that first step is either either um you know, intensively save and, and uh, you know, put yourself in a position savings wise that you don't have to work um, or, um, you know, yeah, find, uh, you know, location independent employment. And uh, again, it seems like that's kind of naturally just happening um, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so that's that's um, good. Uh, people kind of got that that forced decompression time last year. Um, a lot of folks did. But um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 a, it's the first step. Um, it's definitely the first step. Mm hmm. Yeah, but then either it can be a, a large pile of savings, right? But, you know, even if you're unproductive and just accumulate or consume these savings, well, eventually they're going to run dry, right? So that's that's something sure. to consider. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, getting that type of digital income is for sure or well, probably a must, right? But the, the other side to financial independence, not just on the income side, but on the expenditure side, right? If you, if you spend less, well, your savings right. will last you longer. 
And so how did you feel the, the cost aspect of this nomadic lifestyle compared to others? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the, the biggest portion of most people, you know, if we're talking about the survival society, the biggest portion of people's income usually goes to like a mortgage or to, to rent or something along those lines. So um, if you uh, if you move into, I guess, a situation um, like, uh, for example, Rayo, the first thing that the first lifestyle he pursued was van nomadism. And Max, like like you, um, he uh, he moved out and he moved out into a van, um, into a camper mounted on his pickup truck. So obviously that major that biggest expense is gone. Um, and, uh, we did, uh, uh, an entire series on van nomadism, I guess a few years back on the Vani podcast. And, uh, yeah, um, from a bunch of case studies, uh, a bunch of different case studies, I mean, anywhere from like 500 to a thousand dollars a month, um, is what a lot of these people were living on. Um, and, uh, yeah, from, from my experience, um, I was staying, um, I was just, I was just camping out of my vehicle, um. I was just yeah, tent camping out of my Mercury Grand, Mercury Grand Marquis, um, but uh, yeah, I found uh, I found a, a place to camp that was like seven dollars a night north of Austin, beautiful place, and uh, um, you know, um, <clears throat> like I said, the the unfortunate part is I was dependent upon the survival society for everything, so I had to go buy I had to buy everything, but I mean I didn't have much to spend I didn't have much to spend anyway, so I was kind of I, I had to spend what I could spend, and it was it wasn't much, so um, yeah, um, cutting cutting expenses is definitely definitely important. Um, it's uh um that alone um that step alone um could be i guess uh, that 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 first step for a lot of people if they just cut their if they just cut their expenses up to a certain amount they might find that instead of working 40 hours a week they can now only work 20 and if that's you know half your time um and uh, you know you're, you're halfway there to uh you know a liber liberated lifestyle per se so um yeah hopefully I answered your question I'm rambling off there again <laughs> no, no, I, I do enjoy the ramblings quite a lot. And yeah, I, I, like that's that's a nice thing, right? When uh, just alone by cutting off a physical building and especially when combining your, your mode of transport and your place of living together, right, into one entity, one truck basically to live out of, uh, that, yeah, that save costs quite a bit. Uh, but like the, the biggest downside, as you said, and I would very much agree with that, is that you do need to import a lot of things from, from the first round, right? Food, mm -hmm. diesel, and all types of things you're constantly in need to trade with others uh, like wh where do you think are, are the downsides of this more specifically yeah yeah well i mean uh, um yeah so the, the the i guess the mortgage you know the physical location is gone that's a good first step the next the next biggest expense from expense for most people is food and if you move out into um you know a van um or and or from like a mortgage into a, a, a an apartment with small with you know with less rent or something you save more money um then i mean uh, you're you're limited you're limited on space to do things right you're limited on 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 the space you have to produce um whatever it is that you want to produce um so yeah, that that's definitely that's that's definitely kind of the the, the biggest downside is uh, um, you know dealing with that um, yeah dealing with that I guess that that smaller space and, and something we're trying to um, I mentioned Pasnia here and I mentioned uh, you know kind of the the groundwork for this was just traveling van nomads. Well, that is kind of that, that is one of the one of the I guess what one of the problems. Um, so what my vision my overall vision for Pasnia is more of kind of a second realm network. Um, so we've got uh, this homestead, um, this homestead here uh, at, at Veritas Pasnia is what I'm um, what I'm calling it, and uh, there's one out east. There's uh, you know freedomcells.org, which has a lot of it's just there's a lot of isolated people um, that need to be connected. Um, but really, the ideal I, the idea would be to have these self sufficient homesteads um, that you know of, of like minded people within the second realm network that have been vetted, and um, Basically, you, you get into this network and you can camp at any of these places. Um, you don't have to rely upon the first realm for food because, like, for example, if, you know, mine's a model for, for other homesteads, you'd have lamb, you'd have ducks, you'd have turkey, you'd have chicken. Um, like, you'd have all of these things and you'd have, and this year we're starting a big garden too. So that's that's the other thing. Um, but, <clears throat> but yeah, so, like, that that's kind of the, the idea is, is one, like... So there's there's kind of the you know the notion of having your cake and eating it too. Well, I'm trying to make that possible, um, <laughs> like I'm trying to make it possible where you can you can have like um, where this network it gets built up and you could live a totally nomadic lifestyle and still not be reliant upon the first realm where we have you know our own infrastructure, our own economy, um, all of those things. So um, yes, to your point, that is the the biggest thing with the with nomadic lifestyles is just the fact that you can't take as much stuff with you. You have less less room to produce um, in most situations, um, and the the solution to that is is uh, as I was saying, kind of this this second realm network um, that I'm kind of well, just kind of I'm trying to 
I guess put together here in the USSA, but certainly, um, certainly, um, I, I'm guessing it's probably already in motion um, elsewhere overseas. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Uh, I, and like this aspect of secure citadels, right? Secure temporal autonomous mm -hmm. zones, and a private and secure way of traveling in between them. Uh, I, I agree. I think this is really kind of the golden ticket <laughs> where you can have the cake and, and eat it too. Yep. Yep. And then, um, and on that property, and, and here again, to have your cake and eat it too, I'll add another layer to this. Um, you know, be, like the one of the, the biggest areas of coercion is, you know, um, you know, the legal interstices with the state where uh, like especially like with proper so-called property ownership where you've got a title, they they expect you to pay property, property taxes every year and those sorts of things like that opens up an individual to um, opens them up to to inevitable coercion. Like that's at least a couple times a year where you have to interface with the with the state on not a very fun and friendly level. Right. So, um, you know, talking about the second realm here, um, the proxy merchant strategy, we're in the property that you um, that you have these homesteads on isn't in the name of the person that actually lives there. It's in the name of somebody who is an upstanding person, upstanding citizen of the first realm um, that would never draw suspicion from anyone. Um, and uh, then you've got a, you've got an, an added layer of protection there. And then, as I said, you you uh, you just incorporate these security culture principles, these Vani principles that Rayo um, you know utilized back in the 1960s. And if any of your um, any of uh, any folks in the audience are inter interested in checking that out, so um, I would recommend just going to uh, vanipodcast.com um, free books tab and you can learn learn about Rayo's lifestyle and, and get a pretty good taste uh, um there at uh, um from either Vonnie book one or Vonnie book two but uh yeah really just incorporating incorporating these principles um and doing it in such a manner so that we can have this this uh you know permanent place right we can have this permanent place that can also be um relatively invulnerable to coercion so that's that's kind of the ideas and you aren't supposed to be able to do that right have your cake and eat it too well, we're gonna try it and see um see how it works out <laughs> Yeah, I mean, right. That's the, that's the whole point of, of liberty of, of is to try to experiment, right, and to recklessly reach out into new areas that were deemed impossible before, and just mm -hmm. to see if it actually works out and maybe works out in a great extent. Yeah. So you've you've mentioned now a couple of times, like the the concept of harassment, and this is, I think, one of the the great contributions of Rayo in the terms of of Vonu, like that definition of mean time to harassment. Now, what is that actually, and why is it a meaningful metric to look at? Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, the mean time to harassment was um, so really one of one of the problems I guess that Rayo also foresaw is that there's a lot of a lot of strategies where it's impossible, where it's nearly impossible to gauge the efficacy of a strategy. So, like political crusading, for example, like we know it doesn't work, but like if you actually try to like actually try to put it out statistically like it's very very hard to actually quantify the success rate of someone running for office um or for for a lot of for a lot of strategies it's hard to quantify those things so rayo actually came up with this this concept of mean time to harassment and basically it's a way to gauge the um the efficacy of of a of a bonnie lifestyle so um for example um it would measure the amount of time between um, instances of coercion. So, for example, a van nomad who might have uh, um, a van nomad might have more interactions um, or have a, a lower mean time to harassment than um, someone who uh, practiced wilderness fauna in the middle of the woods. Um, they would have more interactions with the survival society. They have more interactions with coercers in general. So that's the idea. Is it's just a way to gauge the efficacy of a Vani, a Vani lifestyle, um, and it's in terms of how often um, you interact with um, with the state, with uh, with the state, or with private coercers. Is is the idea? Yeah, right. And I like that aspect too. That it's it's not just the state who's who's of course a big attacker, but private individuals are assholes as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, like just you know, getting beaten over by thugs or your your purse stolen uh, is uh, is you know harassment already. And uh, just by including this statistic as well as any interaction with the state, right? Like requiring a license plate or paying property taxes or all these all these things where that are not based on a voluntary ethical uh, action can be nicely quantified and then as you said right compared across strategies mm -hmm. and we can kind of get a su success metric out of this right and and I'll also mention one other element that he puts uh and, and vani book one again vani podcast.com just go to that free books tab if you want to pull up this chart um it's in vani book one the search for personal freedom but uh, there's a chart in there too and the other element that he puts on there is, is is activity so um if you are a pedestrian you know traveling through the wilderness where there's nobody out there the activity is going to be very very low 
Um, whereas if you're starting, you know, it's like small manufacturing facility, the activity is going to be a lot higher. So that's another element too, is, um, another element to mean time to harassment is, is also gauging, you know, like your, your own efficacy and your own, um, your own, I guess, uh, possibilities, um, with, with your skills. Um, so someone who is not very proficient at, um, I don't know, security culture principles are not very proficient at, um, you know, practicing the grand man or something along those lines. They might not be the best person to like start an intentional committee or something like that, right? Um, they might be best, uh, you know, getting a van and going and learning these things and trying it out and, you know, a, much, a more safer route, I guess you could say. One that would draw less attention um, where they can, you know, kind of blend in and just kind of um, learn these things in a, in a safe, a, a more, you know, safe and conducive environment. Um, so, yeah, that's another, another element, too, when we're talking about volume lifestyle changes is the activity or the proficiency um, that one would need to have. Um, and again, to go back to this example, um, you know, starting intentional community, which involves, you know, dispute resolution and all sorts of complex stuff versus some driving a car around, which we're taught to do when we're 16, you know, by the state. So if the state can teach us to drive, um, you know, via their, you know, their dumb DMVs and shit, then it's probably a pretty easy thing to do, right? So, um, yes, we're talking about proficiency levels here uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the the activity of of what you do is is very important here, right? And there's a scale, right? You you could just mm -hmm. be you know alone in the wilderness hunting and and foresting berries or whatnot, right? But that's a very different thing than running a small manufacturer to produce I don't know the tables or some carpentry, and that's again very different to running a multinational global uh, a corporation interacting with hundreds of of customers and employees. Right? There there will be different attackers for each of these and different threat vectors and threat models that have to be considered. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's, the, that's, 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 yeah, very, very well said. Very, yeah, very well. I don't think I have anything to add, but that's a very good way to put it. Yeah. And I, th I think here it, the, the concept of privacy really ties in nicely. Uh, so like where, where do you see, or how, how would you define privacy uh, and, and how does it fit in here? Sure, sure. Um, so privacy, I guess, uh, t to me is, uh, um, to me is just, uh, I guess it's, um, my right to self ownership, um, exposed when I want to be, exp or I guess, I guess, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's core to my self ownership, but really the, the idea is to, to expose myself when I want to expose myself. Right. Um, and not mean that in a way that I'm not, don't mean that in the way that I think it is, but I expose myself to the world in the way, like when I, when I want to expose myself to the world in a way that I want to. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, having that choice, um, is, 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 is really, is really privacy. And, um, I guess, uh, in terms of, um, <clears throat> so yeah, that, that, uh, yeah, sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, maybe to, to paraphrase that, right. It's, it's about selectively revealing yourself right, to the yep, world. Yep, yep, yep. Right. And it's, it's much easier to like, you get away with not at all revealing yourself to the world. If you are in the, in the forest alone, you know, hunting a deer, right? That's, that's a very limited type of exposure and very little individuals will actually see you and attribute the actions to your person, mm -hmm. right? Well, compared to if you were running this large business with thousands of clients and employees, well, you know, necessarily you will have to reveal yourself uh, to a greater extent. So to get right. the job done. Right. Yeah. And, and, and then how, how does that aspect of when you actually reveal yourself come into the security aspect in terms of the OODA loop? Yeah. So, um, in terms of volume more generally, you mean? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, really it comes down to, uh, um, so there's, so yeah, with, with Vanu, obviously the lifestyle change would, would make a difference. If you're Vanuing in city, if you're Vanuing, uh, pursuing Vanu in a city, um, you're going to have a lot more exposure, potential exposure, um, than, yeah, as you're saying, someone who's, uh, you know, pursuing wilderness Vanu out in the middle of the woods. Um, so as far as when, um, you know, when that, that revealing happens, well, there, there's another important Vani principle that Rayo came up with called uh, import-export. Um, and uh, the idea is to, uh, you know, import goods and knowledge from the Servile Society back to your Vani home base. Uh, and then you export your labor back to um, the Servile Society. So um, this is, uh, you know, making up for the fact that, you know, back in the 1960s, they didn't have, you know, the online freelance entrepreneurship sort of angle. So 
back in the 1960s, you had to basically, ex- you had to go back to the city to work. Um, you'd, you'd work a really intensive, you know, maybe you'd work really intensive job for three months, intensively save, and then go live in the woods for six months was kind of his, was kind of his strategy. So um, how does the OODA loop and expose, and I guess, uh, you know, selectively exposing oneself in, um, in, in terms of Vani? Well, um, it would come down to import-export, um, how often you choose to interface with the survival society. Um, so if you, uh, if you have more, if you have live more nomadic lifestyle and you have many supply caches on private property scattered throughout, and you don't have to have very much interaction with the survival society, then um, you wouldn't have to, um, you know, reveal your privacy, um, reveal your privacy that often, um, you know, to to the survival survival society to potential coercers. So yeah, it would come down to, um, yeah, just depending upon what lifestyle change you choose. Um, obviously, more people, um, more chance of coercion generally speaking, and uh, then also import-export, uh, how often you need to interface with the survival society um, would be how often you might have to, um, you might have to, or you might, uh, I guess, inadvertently um, reveal your, your privacy in some manner. Yes, exactly. And so, uh, of, of course, most optimal would be if, if there would be no revelation to the first realm whatsoever, right? So if you could mm-hmm. fully stay within that second realm uh, in a Vanu principled uh, or ethical enclave. Uh, but this will be difficult, right? Because division of labor is nice and there are many monkeys in the first realm who can do things for you. And so somehow interacting with them uh, while still protecting your privacy and not necessarily revealing that you are the one engaging in that in that activity uh, is a very interesting privacy strategy. Uh, so, what are what are some of the steps to do this more efficiently? I mean, you you mentioned uh, uh, first round proxy merchants already, but are there some some other strategies? <clears throat> Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, in, in terms of volume, I guess, uh, another, another element of this that, that I could, um, that's, um, yeah, the, the, the proxy merchant strategy is, is, is really for, um, for more of the, uh, permanent autonomous zones. That's, that's kind of the route to go. Um, but yeah, again, it, it's just dependent upon, on, upon the lifestyle change for, um, for, for folks. So a lot of folks are, are stuck in cities for, for one reason or another, maybe employment, maybe work, maybe, maybe whatever. Um, but, uh, in, in terms of, you know, privacy in the cities, um, I would just point, uh, um, point your, your listeners, uh, to, in the direction of, you know, strategies like the gray man blending in. Um, and then, um, Kyle Reardon, uh, posts on uh, my coast, old coast, I guess on the Vani podcast now, hopefully if we be back, he'll be back at some point. Um, but he wrote a book called just below the surface, a guide to security culture. And, uh, obviously it goes into kind of the, the low tech and the high, some of the high tech sort of, uh, sort of privacy stuff. Um, but then also, um, it goes into, um, I guess a, maybe an, an often under, um, an un- underlooked at aspect um, of this is that, uh, um, like, uh, act- he he looked at uh, some activist organizations as case studies that have just been terrible on privacy. If you, if the the leaders have been, you know, have been uh, have been, you know, infiltrated, you know, infiltrators, and they reveal the entire, you know, membership list and you know intake information to you know the feds or something. So that's another element too. Is just um, be very, I guess, just be careful about who you who you interact with. Um, you know, practice, practice good vetting. Um, and, uh, you know, here at Pasnia, we've got a strict principle that, you know, you have to forswear the use of coercion, uh, if you're going to come on the property. So, um, you know, I just, uh, um, those would, those would just be, a, I guess, a, a couple of things, uh, in terms of some, some of the, some of the nomadic, um, some of the nomadic lifestyles, um, it can, it can be difficult, um, especially for, um, uh, and again, I don't have personal experience with this, so everything that I find out is just just on the internet and from from folks who have reported on it. When I was on Fashion Book, and they would you know post in groups and such, but um, like if you're living on a sailboat, for example, um, I have heard I've I've gotten gotten verification from a number of on a number of occasions that like if you're going to go into a port like at a city. Um, if you're going to go conduct import export on a boat, like not only do you have to check in with like one government agency, but usually it's like five different bureaucracies that you have to check in with, um, like living on a sailboat. So as far as it it can get, it's it's very very nuanced, and um and and a lot a lot of that nuance comes from you know experience of doing it over and over again. So um yeah, that's that's just uh, uh I, I'll mention living on a sailboat as 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 that that one kind of complication, um, but um. I guess other other strategies. Um, yeah, um, other strategies. I guess yeah. Like, like I said, just just be careful about who you, who you're working with. Make sure they're they're vetted and um, 
yeah, I think that's 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 another important thing because it's it's not always this it's um it's not always the state like the state usually doesn't do a very good like the, the, the like um, you know as far as investigative work they don't usually do any of that right like um it's usually just people snitching or open source intelligence they just you know look on fascist book or something so um yeah if you cut out uh you know if you if you're just if you're careful about that um yeah I think that's a very very good thing. And there's probably one point of conflict here that, uh, well, free individuals are usually private individuals, right? And they very carefully choose what to reveal uh, about themselves to others. But on the other hand, right, as you said, we kind of need to get that, that reputation and that vetting of the history of another person to ensure that they actually do live by voluntarist principles. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you kind of manage that conflict of working with anonymous people while still gathering reputation from them? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely tough, but um, or at least it's it's tough, and it's in its it's in a, it's in a, it's in its early stages right now. Um, but yeah, I, I said for for Paznia for this physical one, like um, you know, I do know the um, I like there's given them names and pseudonyms for these for these individuals, but really it was just it was a spontaneous thing. I, again, I did not plan any of this. It just so happened that for the past five years I've been vetting these people, um, and they're all you know the the best the best people. I want them out here, and that's why that they're coming out here. But uh, um, yeah, so that like, if you're if you're in a position to plan something like that, like go to five years of freedom festivals, which um, you know, and and build up you know reputation that way. Like that's a really good way. Or just you know other other you know temporary autonomous zones with you know freedom minded individuals. Um, you know, over a course of a number of years, um, you can pretty much tell. Um, <clears throat> you can you can pretty you can pretty much tell. Um, I, I would say beyond that. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Beyond that, uh, I mean, there's, there's, it's, it really. I think it's just uh, experimenting with rep experimenting with reputation systems, um, physical space and time. Um, yeah, it's that's tough because I, I yeah, it's, it's, that's tough because I, I the, at least at least as at this point, I don't know these folks by by, by pseudonyms. So, um, I know I'm at a deeper level than that. So, um, yeah, it's a w little tough there. Um, yeah, I guess that that's what what I can offer. Um, yeah, it's what I can offer at this point. Yeah, I've, like it's. I mean, for for sure, right? The more you engage with pseudonymous identities, the more they do reveal themselves, and the more reputation you can gather up, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the like, it's it's also a question of scale, right? Because sure, it's it's small scale. You can probably do a very thorough vetting process and really consider. Uh, in depth if you want to work with one person or not but of course there's a huge cost to it right and and a lot of well uh, hassle and uncertainty that will probably fail to scale to any meaningful gathering of more than a couple hundred people yeah yeah and for for a lot of people finding that first person to vet is hard enough um you know finding that first person that they're gonna mm -hmm. you know the, the vet for a local you know to start an intentional community or something that's going to be hard to find um for for, for some folks even um so yeah the the you know have, having that time um yeah having that time is great um but beyond that i mean it's yeah experimenting with reputation systems um you know smuggler and uh smuggler and xyz and second round book on strategy talked about uh, you know anonymous trading booths and things um you know like that's the sort of that like those are the i mean um you know here right now like i said like it's all very very person personal like we're, we're trying to build an intentional community here so we all know each other very well um but we also want to you know open that outwards um, and yeah, you know, start, lo start looking at some of these things too, because, um, I mean, we, we want to be able to trade with as many people as safely as possible, right? Like we want to open up, open up trade, open up, you know, this pocket of freedom to as many people as we can. We have to do it in a safe manner. And if there's a way where we can trade and not even have like, uh, you know, I, I guess just additional ways, um, like that, um, yeah, I think those are, those are worth looking into, but yeah, all those are theoretical right now for me. Um, at least, at least a lot of them. Um, but, uh, yeah, really just the, the tried and true vetting, the tried and true method of vetting, whether it's, you know, um, whether it's, uh, you know, in person or online, um, you know, just <laughs> whether you know them or if, or someone that you both know and trust can, um, can verify, like that's still, that's still, I, I think kind of the, the best way to go. Um, I, I don't see a, see a way around that. I don't know if I want to go around that, that more personable route, um, personally. Yes, and I wonder how much technology can actually help us to kind of scale that interaction, specifically because we can use, you know, advanced cryptography and, you know, incentive structures so that we can collaborate with others without necessarily re relying trust or security, 
uh, into their hands. Right? So for example, the Wasabi coin drawing coordinator is a perfect example for this as it is a centralized service, right? but that central service has no information about its customers whatsoever. And therefore attacks and harassment by that service provider or even someone attacking the service provider uh, become no longer feasible, right? Because there is literally nothing to steal. And because of that, like specifically the Wasabi coordinator can in fact court or talk and do business with a plethora of anonymous people without any reputation whatsoever, just because that the underlying uh, protocol is secure enough. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure technology can play a role. I mean, uh, um, I, the last time we talked, Max, we, we uh, you know, referred back to Rayo's, um, I guess, theoretical vision of what I guess turned out to be um, BISC in some ways. But uh, um, yeah, just, uh, um, yeah, really tr trying, trying to find ways, uh, tr trying to find ways using, using technology to, to do these things. Um, yeah, I, th I think there's, uh, there's, there's, yeah, um, especially in the realm of uh, Bitcoin and uh, as encrypted communications, there's there's certainly a lot of I think a lot of promise there. Um, definitely, definitely for sure. Um, but yeah, for reputation, um, yeah, still still uh, still like the uh, um, still like the personable routes, um, which yeah again doesn't always work doesn't always work in scale for for digital, which I understand. Um, but uh, yeah. Yes. Now, one other interesting way to get at least a level of reputation is with financial skin in the game. And I, I know that you're experimenting with, with some type of like uh, financial shared Bitcoin accounts uh, that, that can be used in like emer for emergency expenses. Could you elaborate a bit more on, on how that actually works for you? Yes. Um, yes. So um, obviously, uh, yeah, that's another um, another great method of, uh, you know, uh, a great vetting method which is not not an ironclad one but you can weed out um you can weed out a number of folks a uh, number of folks that way you can find the most committed ones at least um but yeah um at uh, uh for pasnia um we've got a stakeholder um thing which uh people can i guess uh, it's kind of like the, the membership thing for the intentional community um but beyond that we have the um just uh, a fellow pasnian um who uh, uh fellow pasnia came up with this idea we call it the, uh, the establishment of the pasnia general bitcoin fund um and you'll note if for for people, if you, if you look at Pasnia.com, most of this is culture jamming, so like it's supposed to be a, it's supposed to be a joke, it's supposed to be funny. Um, so yeah, this is the the Pasnia General Bitcoin Fund, and uh, um, yeah, the the person that set it up, and I guess this is a good, uh, I guess one one interesting way for um, for for reputation is that you know he goes by a pseudonym Josiah Warren. Um, yeah, Josiah Warren was a intentional community guy back a, a while ago, I think in the late 1800s. For those who who are interested. But uh, um, yeah, to um, to to some of the folks um, that have you know seen this fund and all that, um, he's just a synonymous individual. But uh, you know he's, he's he's verified and all that. But yeah, the, the idea is uh, um, he set up this fund. Um, you know if they've they've got to be a pas they've got to be a stakeholder of Pasnia. Um, you know he he laid out some some stipulations. But yeah, the, the idea is um, if there's um, you know, for a for a you know legal defense fund for homestead upgrades for um, he even put in if someone wants you know publishing assistant or needs uh, you know help with publishing um, you know that's in there too. Um, but yeah, the the idea is he 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 uh, made an initial donation into this into this Bitcoin fund. Some other folks made uh, made donations, and so I think um, as of the last that I heard as um, as of a couple weeks ago, um, a portion of that fund's going to be uh, allocated towards uh, you know the Pasnia out uh, that Pasnia out east. Um, so there's going to be some some homestead upgrades happening, um, you know, to the overarching Pasnia network. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's that's a little bit on the on the Pasnia general Bitcoin fund. But yeah, just uh, um, yeah, just a, a way to 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 crowdfund uh, to 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 crowdfund some some second realm activity. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Uh, and I remember from the book Hashtag Agora, which I believe you also have published, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there there is the scene where where the two characters uh, are you know uh, traveling with some contraband, some some laptops, uh, high security devices that they plan to sell, and ultimately they get uh, snitched up by by the cops mm -hmm. uh, and uh, led into some interrogation uh, camp. While then the uh, because they were in such a second realm well, gathering and specifically part of such a security fund, right? Uh, their comrades uh, basically outside, not yet under attack, then issued uh, like uh, or got a lawyer to actually get them out of the situation, right? And in in this way, 
even though you're under attack, because you know that there is some amount of Bitcoin stashed outside for specifically those purposes uh, to get you out of the, the mm -hmm. uh, tough situation, uh, I think this is a, a very big de a decrease of uncertainty uh, and uh, at, at least the, the hindrance of the level of harassment that can be happening. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And um, I was uh, I talked to uh, to Sal Mayweather from the Agora podcast a couple 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 few weeks ago. And one thing that uh, um, I think it was Derek, another Derek Bros, another guest brought up was kind of like an Agora's defense fund, like some sort of like worldwide cooperative sort of thing. Um, I think I, I think all those things are are, are fantastic, um, and uh, they they need to be they need to be pursued. I mean, it's another regardless of um, um, you know when it comes to the second realm, regardless of what area of the human experience we're talking about, like all of that needs to be internalized. You know, like in the second realm um, because if it exists in the first realm it, it exists in the realm of coercion um, at the very least and often at the violation of privacy too so um, yeah this is just another one of those things uh, you know what, what if you want to call it uh, charity or um, wh whatever it is I mean this that this is an element um, you know this is uh, this is an element of it and uh, yeah yeah I'm happy it's uh, I, I, I so yeah shout out to Josiah Warren for uh, for coming up with this and uh, for funding the fund if it, uh, initially um, yeah for sure yeah, very useful endeavor. Absolutely. Um, as, as you mentioned previously, uh, Rayo also spoke a lot about well encrypted communications. Uh, so maybe can you elaborate a bit on on why this is so important in the Vonu strategy? Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, you know, I, I say a lot uh, that, you know, if the coercers can't find you, they can't coerce you. Well, if the coercers can't read what you write, then they can't use you know, they can't use your words against you. Um, if all if all it is is just, you know, uh, illegible, uh, you know, ciphertext, um, then, uh, yeah, they can't really they can't really get a whole lot of that, a whole lot out of that. Um, so, yeah, that, it's uh, yeah. Encryption, um, encrypted communication certainly plays a role in, 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 uh, in the Vanu sphere. And, um, I mean, uh, um, a further iteration, I would say, you know, we've, we've got, uh, you know, Rayo Ray talked about kind of the encrypted ham radio networks. Um, there's, uh, you know, obviously the low tech, you know, low tech, um, you know, ciphers, um, you know, using, you know, pen and paper. Um, well, uh, I guess a, a newer kind of iteration that I'll toss in that's, uh, that's Kyle Rear and actually wrote an article on it uh, in, in his book, uh, Just Below the Surface, A Guide to Security Culture. But that's called dual layer encryption, and uh, the idea is that uh, uh, you know uh, you know digital digital encryption is great, but why not add an extra layer of security to it? So um, the idea is to come up with a um, you know come up with like a uh, um, you know handwritten cipher, um, and you would put that into PGP. You would you write the message, you'd encrypt it with the handwritten cipher, whatever whatever you guys agree, whatever you and the the, the recipient agree upon. Um, you would put that into, say, PGP or whatever encryption software you're using. It would encrypt it there. Then they would decrypt it on their ends digitally. Then they would decrypt it manually on the other end. So, yeah, I mean, all this stuff um, plays into it. If you look uh, if uh, you, you look into Rayo's writings, he was, you know, I mean, back in the 1960s, like there, like, there are some things like, I mean, he 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 went about as far as yeah he went about as far as you could um, in the realm of yeah in this realm of you know privacy and security culture. So um, yeah, it, it plays a major role. Um, it plays a, a major role. Um, again, if the coerces can't find you, they can't coerce you, and if they can't read what you write, then they can't use your words against you. So um, yeah. Yes, that's uh, that really is an an important part, right? And especially when it comes to trade. And I mean, sure, some chit chat and small talk uh, wouldn't even be that bad if the coercers would find that. But if we're actually talking about business dealings and contracts, then yes, encrypting communications is is even more important. And as there's actual physical property on the line. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Yeah, so one of the other things that you also mentioned a bit previously was basically stashing, right? And having uh, physical locations where some equipment or food is stored. Can you please go a bit more into the details of why this is important and how to actually set it up? Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. So the, the idea is, uh, you know, as, as we, we talked about a little bit ago with nomadic lifestyles, the, the idea, the, the one of the problems is storage or, um, you know, self-sufficiency, right? Like if you always have to go to the survival society for food, then, um, you know, you're not very, you know, independent from it. So, um, you know, Rayo um, back, uh, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, he had supply caches, uh, you know, all over, I think, in British Columbia region, uh, Northern California, Southern Oregon, uh, the Siski region. Um, you know, with uh, with food, you know, camping supplies, whatever, whatever he may he may may have needed out there, uh, you know, in the wilderness. 
So, um, yeah, the, the idea is, uh, you know, and, and, and that sort of sense, more of an individual sort of sense um, to, you know, bury supply caches with things you might need um, in that area if, 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 if ever need be. And um, so you'd, you'd have access to them. It gives you, it, it increases your storage space, um, at least. It, it's, it's another way of, of having your cake and eating it, too. And uh, I guess the, 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 newest iteration of that and what we're as, as i've been talking about what we're trying to do yeah, with pasnia is, is make it where you know these supply caches aren't just you know aren't just you know empty 55 gallon drums but um they're actually like a, it's actually like a community with a culture and with you know all sorts of stuff so um yeah that's that's just the idea it's a it's a, it's a way to um increase the the storage and salt and uh, self-sufficiency capabilities um despite uh, you know living a nomadic lifestyle and not having uh you know a, a 22 acre homestead or not having a, a house with a basement and, and a storage room uh, or things like that it's uh these are these are ways of, of adapting to um yeah adapt these are yeah ways of adapting to um, yeah, smaller living spaces and, and just different situations in general Yes, and in addition to that, I found it always very interesting when Sreo said that it's also a kind of nice diversion tactic so that, for example, if you have a campsite somewhere where there are not many goods laying around, there's not much food, uh, there's not many tools, there's not much wood supply or whatnot, right? If it's if it's just a bare bone, you know, living quarter, then this looks much less suspicious, right? Uh, compared to if you know there's a year's worth of food supply and such on stashed in the campsite directly, right. that will draw a lot of attention if someone actually passes by. So that idea that even though if you would have a physical location to store some of your wealth, uh, it, it uh, like hidden and dis dispersed away from your actual main living place mm -hmm. makes your main living place also less attractive for looters uh, which is a great uh, privacy and security strategy again yeah yeah um for sure for sure yeah and, re and redundancy uh, especially you know we're, we're talking uh, you know digital uh digital realm now or you know bitcoin private keys uh um don't only keep that at you know one vanu home base you know make sure those are uh, you know all spread all over the place and that you always uh, always have a way to access them um so yeah um yeah, they're uh, they're 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 great tools. Um, certainly great tools. And uh, I guess I will mention just uh, since we're we're on this realm, I, I came across a book by uh, Lumpanks Unlimited, um, called uh, "How to." I guess uh, it's the big book, big book of secret hiding places. And um, the uh, the author Jack Luger goes into, uh, into into some of that stuff. It's available for free online, um, as all our stuff is, um, as as everything I put out is. But um, yeah, if you're interested in learning more about uh, hiding stuff. Um, I uh, I found that to be a very uh, very valuable book um, to, to to read and to digitize. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll toss that one out there. And then also we talked about uh, um, the Vani podcast. If, if people just go to vanipodcast dot com forward slash episodes, um, it's all laid out by seasons. Season one is the philosophy of Vani. Season two is the practice of Vani. Um, in season two, we talk about food storage. Uh, in one episode, and um, I think there's probably another episode or two that talks about uh, you know similar and related subjects. I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, we have great tools for sure. Yes. So I, th I think we did cover quite a decent amount of ground uh, in, in the Vanu philosophy. Uh, is there any major point uh, that we have not yet talked about? Um, not really, I guess. Um, I guess I, I should have, um, which, which hopefully um, folks have gone and checked it out by now if, they, if they're interested. But um, Vanu is, a, is an awkward contraction of the words voluntary and not vulnerable. Um, and uh, yeah, just premise around becoming as invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the survival society is humanly possible. That's what uh, all of the all of the Vani lifestyle changes are geared are geared towards. Um, that's why I found this the second realm strategy so um, you know so so important. That's why I find uh, you know uh, Bitcoin privacy um, just so critically important. Um, you know, like it's uh, these these are all very very in interconnected strategies. Um, and uh, I. I yeah, I, I certainly do hope that uh, your audience find, finds value in it, checks it out, and, and lets me know if, if they're living a liberated lifestyle. Always, always love to hear about it. So, um, yeah. Yes, uh, very nice. Right, the, I, that that aspect. Like, I I appreciate Vanu not just because I think it's actually a sound strategy for a freer lifestyle. But also because it has that ethical emphasis at the foreground, right? It, it has to be a voluntary interaction, otherwise it's not even in the realm of Vanu whatsoever. And so it, it completely uh, uh, makes it impossible for one who actually lives by the strategy to become aggressive and, and to become that coercer. Um, and and as, you, as you said, right, anyone who comes to Pasnia and actually steps on your property will have to swear that he does not aggress against others. 
Yeah, well, in, in a sense, yes. Everyone here, like, we, we do have, uh, if <laughs> again, it's the Free Republic of Pasnia, if uh, we do have a Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Um, so, yeah, the, the initial stakeholders, um, I, I think all of them have probably, um, you know, actually signed, so maybe with a pseudonym, which is what we encourage here. We don't, we, we, we always encourage uh, pseudonyms here. But, uh, yeah, they a lot of them have explicitly signed the Constitution. But, yes. Um, that it's, 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 it's critical. Um, it's, it's a critical foundational, um, point, you know, there, there are a lot of people in my, in my personal life who I know they're good people. Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't really want to trade with them. I don't really want to, um, interact with them a whole lot because they, they still, um, you know, they haven't exercised that, that, uh, that spook of coercion. They haven't exercised that. So, um, you know, I, I hope they do. And, you know, I want, we obviously want to open up Pazni as to as many people as possible, but, um, yeah, unfortunately this is just, this is the way we have to do it. But, um, at the same time, um, you know, it's, uh, it's still a lot, it's a, it's a lot of fun and, uh, yeah, you know, guys, uh, I, I, I've tried to emphasize this in the past couple of interviews I've done, but, uh, you know, free, freedom is definitely possible and especially, you know, um, you know, um, you know, people who've been listening to Max know, know that. So, um, yeah, it's definitely possible. And, uh, with that, yeah, Max, thanks for inviting me on. It was a great chat and, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, Vonu is yours for the making, right? To to steal your catchphrase, <laughs> <Yep. laughs> but it's uh, it's it's a very adequate one, and right? uh, it it really is possible uh, to live a free life and, and a peaceful life, and and not just to to just survive meagerly uh, in in such a place, but to actually excel. Uh, I I think both you and I can speak for that of of how refreshing it is to to have these priorities as the foundational building block for how how to structure your own life. Uh, it's 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 very rewarding and uh, something that I for sure can very much recommend to to further pursue and and to go down, uh, even though that it it might look uh, scary and unintuitive yeah. at first. Yeah. Yep. That's uh, yeah, yes. Absolutely. Exactly. And now again to to quote one more time uh, the book the Agora um, or hashtag Agora um, <laughs> uh, one important phrase uh, that probably all agorists should be interested in and just to to now finish this up uh, Shane what are you actually selling? Um, what, what am I actually selling? So um, so uh, I do uh, uh, so I have a Liberty published uh, Liberty Liberty focused publishing outfit called Liberty Attack Publications um, LibertyAttack dot com we have uh, um, right now we've got uh, you know a lot of uh, a lot of books strategy guides a lot of books on Vonu that I've digitized uh, and put out in paperback format for for those who uh, you know don't like to read things off off computer screens or digital screens in general um, but uh, we also we've also sold some some crypto anarchy tools uh, we sold a, a Vonu pad a Vonu ghost pad with all sorts of cool hacking accessories um, we've only sold one of those so far and uh, hoping to get a lot more of those uh, those sorts of tools back on there so it's not just books um, we are going to try to offer some really really um, um, yeah some really really valuable um, crypto anarchy tools there uh, in the near future um, and uh, if any of your audience is, uh, uh, you know, writing a book and they're, uh, they need help with uh, the publishing process, so we help with that too. Uh, LibertyAttack.com is to go for all that. And uh, as I've been talking about, Vanu podcast, um, yeah, self-freedom strategies essentially is what I do. Um, that's my job now, I guess I can say. Um, so yes, uh, Vanu podcast, uh, uh, for, 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 the, for, uh, for that, you can find us on all the major podcatchers. Um, Library and Odyssey as well, um, got everything backed up there. And uh, otherwise, um, yeah, Paznia.com, um, if you're interested, if you're, you know, in uh, the USSA and, uh, you know, you, uh, you'd like to, to, come, uh, to come visit the Free Republic, uh, Paznia.com is the place to go to learn more. Uh, we've got uh, uh, various Telegram chats. Um, you can find links to those uh, on the website and um, more information about VanuFest. VanuFest 2 is happening at the end of the year. Um, and, yeah, otherwise, I mean, uh, I, guess, I, guess that's, uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> Uh, when are the silver coins and gold coins are actually going to be issued? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So I may, I guess it was a lack of foresight on my part. Um, a bad time to try to get custom coins printed. A really, really bad time to do so. Um, yeah, that, that was going to happen last year. Um, but yeah, it's probably not going to happen for, for at least uh, at least a couple of years. Uh, the, 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 the few companies I found that were still doing their custom minting, they had a way too high of limit. We don't have ta we don't have a treasury here at Pasnia. We don't have we don't have uh, you know we don't have taxation or anything. We can't afford that sort of thing yet. So um, we'll have to we'll have to wait uh, until we have the the funds for that. But uh, yeah, at some point, well, hopefully soon. 
hopefully soon 3d printers who can do gold and silver <laughs> that will be great yes and and the the other problem too is the you have to get um regardless of how many you print whether you print five or twenty five or five thousand you have to print uh, i guess it's the um I, I don't know what you would even call it i, I guess the the uh the uh Oh gosh, the Casing, stencil for it. Maybe. The stencil for it. Um, you have to. Yeah, it's 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 hundreds of dollars just for the stencil. Um, and if we're gonna do six varieties, we gotta have six different stencils. And I think that I think it, it, it it's there's a lot to it. I looked into the entire process. The three D printer would have been, was an interesting one as well. Um, because we did we did have one of those on the property from Vani Fest one. Um, for for a little while. Um, but yeah, it's just too complicated this time. Um, gold yeah, gold silver yeah, little little out of our reach. <laughs> Well, uh, then maybe you can uh, do some some digital coins. Uh, maybe get some color coins on Bitcoin, <laughs> or uh, just a bunch of open dimes uh, with a Pasnia themed. Uh, that would be interesting too. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, Shane. Thanks so much for coming on the show. We it really was a pleasure to talk with you about uh, all things Vanu, agorism, and just living a freer lifestyle in the here and now. Uh, very fascinating rabbit holes. And again, for all the listeners, uh, check out all the great work that uh, Shane has released really a, a plethora of knowledge and in a great archive. Uh, so thanks a lot for coming on. Hey, thank you, Max. I appreciate it. Our strategy for liberty is the creation of a culture of liberty, a society that occupies its own protected space and implements independent systems of cooperation. We need to create a second realm. Device connection terminated.